Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Thomas Ryan, and we have already been talking about sales. So that's exactly what we're talking about today, a little bit. But first, Thomas, introduce yourself. Who is Thomas Ryan? Hi, I'm the CEO and founder of Bigly Sales. Bigly is an AI company that uses AI to generate more sales. And I got to tell you, folks, uh, you know, for those watching on on the YouTube, you see this, but Thomas is a University Hurricanes fan. I see the football back there. We got the helmet back there. I'm a former, I, I got to say former because I went to Florida State. I mean, I went to Syracuse. But I'm, a, I'm a huge Florida State. Same as uh, Charlie Ward, <laughs> Chris Winky, you know, back in the day, Peter Work, but I went to Syracuse, so I can't I can't root for the Knowles anymore. Well, we got a word coming next year to the to the Canes. We got the the top uh, transfer in the country coming over uh, to play quarterback. Oh man, I'm telling you, it's, it's it's I love football season because the Miami Florida State. I know you can talk about Michigan Ohio State and all these other Notre Dame USC, but Florida State Miami is my personal favorite rivalry in any sport, and that includes the North Carolina Duke basketball. I love Florida State versus Miami. That's that's a, such a fun rivalry. But enough about football, Thomas. Let's talk about Bigly. Tell me, what is Bigly Sales? Give me a, give me a background. So we have um, landing page generators that tie in where you can set up a landing page in a few minutes. You can have that then tie directly into our CRM, have all that data automatically saved, and then automate messages out to those people to schedule them into meetings, book them out into appointments, Right, so we can take you entirely through the flow. Um, what we're working on right now uh, after the scheduler uh, is uh, actually doing this with voice as well, that you can have you know, a call center um, basically with the AI, that I can clone your voice, I can clone my voice, you know, I can clone Barack Obama's voice, and you know, we can have uh, any sort of voice answering that phone in any language on earth and be able to fill out any sort of form, capture that data, uh, schedule appointments, um, do a live transfer to uh, an insurance agent, whatever, once that data has been captured. So it can allow businesses to punch above their weight or allow uh, larger businesses to make sure there's someone there ready to answer the phone 24 seven who can book someone into an appointment or bind a policy or whatever they need done. Yeah. Now, now this isn't your first entrepreneurial adventure, correct? Uh, what was, let's, let's talk about your, you know, how you started. So take us back to the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. What motivated you to take the leap? And then what was your first kind of entrepreneurial journey? So both my parents were entrepreneurs. They both uh, run their own businesses. And, um, you know, I worked at my father's company for a while. And, uh, you know, I knew he was getting rid of the company. I went off to grad school. And I started um, really an online staffing business while I was in grad school. And the initial idea didn't work the way I wanted it to. Uh, I, I fought through two years of learning how to build websites, um, learning what the agile methodology means, which is basically instead of trying to write down at the very beginning everything and every user flow that is going to happen. Obviously, you need to do some of that. You should do some wireframing. You should put together a UI. You should see what that UI looks like. But it's to really um, break down a coding or, or any project into smaller digestible tasks and then attack those one by one. Right. So you can have an idea of how things are going to look and how things are going to work. But especially with programming, until you've seen people using your software, until you've seen that users like it and are adopting it, um, to go nuts, you know, spending five years building something it really isn't the recipe for success. You, you want to build something a little smaller. Uh, you, you know, a lot of guys say build half a product and build it really well and make sure it's valuable to your users and then you know you want to watch people using it so um that's really what we did um is we built some software initially i spent a couple of years building it we went through four or five iterations trying to get it out the door i got a referral over to you know some really good engineers uh finally after struggling and um we finally got the project off the ground and then no one used it the way we wanted them to 
So <laughs> is, is, I think that's the age old entrepreneurial story. Hey, we found a solution to a problem. Nobody had. <laughs> like it's something. not no one had it's um, you know, we, we were trying to sell this to fortune hundreds and they bought a different way. You know, they had all moved to, to hiring people a different way rather than on a referral basis. They basically wanted to buy people with a purchasing system the same way they bought paper clips. Right. So you know, they'd be like, oh, you're a, a level three, uh, you know, engineer, we're going to pay 42.79 an hour, you know, people are our strength. Um, <laughs> that's, it's, it is what it is. So, yeah, you know, to that point, you mentioned, you know, people are our strength, and I completely agree with it, uh, that aspect. And you also mentioned, you know, your, your fourth iteration, right before getting out the door, uh, you also talked about creating value. How do how like, you know, as an entrepreneur, how do you find out if you're like, how, what process did you take to ensure that your product was in fact valuable to the end user? So, I mean, if it's something that you really know and you use yourself, you know, that's, um, that's a good start. So I ran sales teams for years and, and with Bigly, what I wanted to solve is kind of some universal problems that we had and basically every other business I knew had when we talked to these guys. So, you know, um, reaching out to people in mass, right? Reaching out to people immediately after they've requested something, you know, so I, I can ask you, you know, how many times have you reached out to a website and they either send you four or five articles that really aren't relevant to what your question is, or they're like, hey, uh, we'll get back to you at some point in the next 12 to 24 hours. Right. And it's to me, I find that very frustrating. Usually I'm reaching out because I need help with something and now I can't get that help. And uh, I have to move on to something else and remember to come back to it. Now it's another item on my to do list. Right. So I think these are kind of universal problems. Um, there's another big one for businesses with a lead. When a lead comes in, and this is going to vary by industry, um, but for I think for a lot of the people who'd be listening to this show, if you don't respond to that lead within the first hour, your odds of closing them drops 90 to 95%. So speed to lead is so important. Uh, when I had my staff in business, if we got to something three or four hours late, you know, oftentimes we might as well throw it in the trash, right? Because if it had already been kicked out to 10 or 20 other vendors and we were late, and it was through some sort of, uh, you know, automated system, everyone had been contacted already, or 90% of the people that we, reach, we reached out to had been contacted. So we'd call the guy and we'd say, oh, yeah, I heard from this other firm yesterday. I heard from this other firm three hours ago. I heard from this other firm 10 minutes ago. So if we were late, you know, I mean, you, you had no chance. Um, so I, I think it's like, the, I mean, think about this. If you're a plumber, Right, or if you're if you have a roof leak, what are you going to do? You're going to call the first guy. That guy doesn't pick up the phone. You're going to pick up the second guy. He goes, "Yeah, I can make it over there in two weeks." And you got water pouring from the ceiling, right? Obviously, that's not going to go. And the next guy says, "Yeah, I can be there in a half hour." You're you're going to be like, "Great, we'll see you in a half hour," and then you're done. And that's that's the behavior for a lot of people with with a lot of different things. So, uh, the software that I have it responds automatically, instantaneously, and then schedules an appointment with that person or pushes them into a call depending on what we need done. You know, that, so. that's such a great valuable point, I think, for the listeners to really understand. Let me give you some examples, like from the podcast perspective, right? Uh, I have to deal with a lot of multiple different systems, right? We have my, let's just take the hosting system, for example. I was using two different hosting systems, one I paid for, one was free. I'm actually sticking with the paid for hosting system because as Thomas mentioned, I had an issue one time with loading a podcast. I emailed them within like that 30 minutes I was uh, responded to and like, Hey, can you send us a screenshot? Let us help you out. They took me through the process and they got it fixed. Meanwhile, you know, the free version of this other hosting system, not as much. Right. And, and that's the value. That's the value add. Right. Because again, my time is valuable. And, and if I'm having to wait an uh, exponential amount of time, I'm going to get upset. For example, if, if you go to a five-star restaurant and your reservation is, is at, you know, 530 and they don't sit you down till six, I don't care how good the food is. You're probably not going to go back to that restaurant because the service wasn't there, 
right? And that's it's all about creating this value. And and I, I really love the way you kind of state it. It's it's really fine to identifying what's valuable to the consumer, right? Not what's valuable to you, uh, in, in doing that. Now, what are some of the pain points that you saw, you know, going through this process? What are some of the biggest pain points that you had to go through? Well, I mean, I found the automation was all the value in what I've done over the years that, you know, the training stuff, obviously you got to train people, but people don't listen, right? I, you know, I, anyone on this show, right? Uh, you know, how many times have you trained somebody like, this is the way that I need you to do it. And then you come back and you look at it and you're like, you didn't do anything that I just said, because that happens to me every week, right? Every week it's, hey, this needs to be done a certain way. And then you come back and you look at it and it has not been done the way that you wanted it to be done. So with this, you can automate the solution. You can, you know, actually have train it once, get it working the way that you want, and then it works that way forever. And now you can scale up to any sort of, you know, usage that, that you need. Um, you know, so that's that's the big thing. As far as, you know, pain points of building a business, I mean, I have too many to count. It's, <laughs> uh, I can write a book on things I've done wrong. So, and, <laughs> I let's, think everyone kind of feels that way. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Now, now let's talk about the actual product and like, let's talk about it from the sense of talk me through it from like, I'm a client and I'm going to actually take on this, uh, you know, bigly AI to help me build my sales. What can an entrepreneur expect and how do they kind of work with them? Yeah. So what we do is we take all your data, right? We take, um, you know, any sort of, material that you have for your sales, right? Why us? What's your company history? What's your products or service? What do you do? Your warranties? You know, we feed all of that information into the AI. And now it uses that as the sole point of truth. It doesn't go to the internet. It doesn't guess. If you've told it this, this is the way it's going to answer. And then we help set up some landing pages for them, make sure we're using best practices to convert. If they need uh, ads, we'll set up ads for them um, using, you know, native Google, Facebook, uh, TikTok, things like that. And there's a bunch of little tricks there where you can just go so wrong um, and it's not intuitive at all. You know, so, I mean, it's just something you have to fight through and I think learn to to get it right, um, you know, and uh, then we'll, we'll set up the whole process for them, right? So we'll basically, we'll train the AI on uh, what their business does. We'll give it all that information. We'll put it in there. We'll set up the pages. We'll set up the flow coming in and then have it automatically respond. And, you know, where we're going with this is to have it actually replace the call center as well. So right now, most of it is over SMS and email. We can auto respond to any message and, you know, again, push someone towards a goal. That goal might be to call between nine and six when their call center is open, right? That goal might be to schedule an appointment for, you know, us to come and do an in-home consultation to fix your roof or redo your bathroom or, you know, uh, do your kitchen or, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff in the home. So, uh, or for insurance, we have a number of insurance and legal clients as well. You know, you, let's, let's, let's talk about the advertisement for a little bit. Cause I think that's a big piece. And in, in I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, including myself, get it wrong. Uh, what are, what are some in your, you know, your experience, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen businesses make when it comes to advertisement? Because there are these little like things you got to know, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen, you know, owners make when it comes to advertising their business? So, I mean, you really need to break it down kind of step by step, right? If we're doing an ad on Facebook, um, you know, I'm going to talk about video. I don't think stills perform very well anymore. I think a lot of people, they only look at reels, right? If you're on Instagram, you know, they're just not really looking at still images that much anymore. And they see a still and they kind of flip right by it. So the first two or three seconds, they actually have a metric on there that you can look at the first three seconds. What's your three second view rate on your videos that you're doing? And you want that to be as high as possible. You want that first three second view rate to be 30, 40, 50% right, to show that you have a good engaging ad. So we do something to stop the scroll on most of our ads, uh, usually relevant to what we're talking about, but something to get them to stop 
and watch that ad because people are so, you know, people are so used to ads. They see you know, thousands of ads a day, right? Between online, billboards, driving places, TV, radio, whatever. I mean, you just hear so many ads. There's so much stuff thrown at you. You're you're used to tuning it out or like if I'm listening to the radio in the car, I just flip to the next channel. Oh, ads, click, right? And it's literally one, you know, twitch of the finger and uh, on my steering wheel and that ad is gone. Um, so that's the most important thing. It's that first three seconds. If people aren't watching your ad, you know, so we were doing like our logo at the beginning, we were doing a little automation in the logo. And I think we would lose like 99% of the people during that automation, right? So uh, that was a fun little learning experience um, that, you know, you need to get the engagement first. And then once you have the engagement, you can, you can try selling to them. You know, we can do testimonials, we can do whatever. We typically want to flip the picture every, you know, second and a half to three seconds, Right. Keep showing new images, keep showing new things on the screen. You put the captions up. There's a lot of tools out there where you can, you know, put captions on the screen that come up underneath. A lot of the people, like 80%, um, have the sound off when they're doing it. So if you're in a meeting at work and you're not paying attention, uh, you want to have the sound off on your phone. You don't want to be listening with sound, right? If you're in, in class watching something, if you're on the bus, if you're, you know, on a train, if it, right, there's a lot of places where people are looking at their phone where they're, they probably shouldn't be, right? If you're, you're, if you're in a public restroom, you know, you're probably not going to have the sound blaring <laughs> on your phone, <laughs> right? But these are all places people look at stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, you got to make, make sure you have the captions on there. You know, that's the big one. And, and uh, just keep it interesting. It's got to be as interesting as the other content that is out there. And if you've gone through Instagram recently, man, the, the, the content's pretty good. I mean, it's, it really is. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. folks, you know, folks less listening, uh, you'll, you'll see a transition in mine as well. You will probably see my first reels as Thomas mentioned, I used to also have an opening little logo montage with my daughter, <laughs> creatively insane. Lose everybody. Nobody cared, right? Um, and now it's now, actually the worst because they see it's an ad. They're like, oh, here's an ad. Yep, Flip. Yeah, exactly. Right? And they keep going. Now, you know, I just kind of to Thomas's point, I just basically it's just a reel of myself with the conversation with the entrepreneur I'm interviewing, and it has captions, right? And so it tries to draw you in with those captions as well. Uh, those again, as Thomas mentioned, those are things I had to learn on my own. But now, Thomas, one thing you're dumb is a three second rule, which is blowing my mind because now I'm going to go back and look at these reels and really see which ones are, are creating the most engagement, um, which I got to say, folks, this is a great time for a shameless plug. You can actually see these reels on our Instagram at the Shades of E as well as our YouTube page and TikTok. So please, please come follow us at the Shades of E on those three channels. Uh, but the reels, you know, one thing I'm starting to see is a lot more engagement from those reels. Now, my biggest area is like, how do I turn those reels? Like one, for example, I have one reel that has like 1800 views. How do I turn those 1800 views into followers? That's my biggest question. And the other thing, if you know some content has performed organically, right? To take that and put some paid dollars behind that or just tweak it a tiny bit and put some paid dollars behind that can really work, right? Because you know that for whatever reason, you're getting engagement. The way most of these social media companies work, you know, if you're talking TikTok or you're talking Facebook or Instagram or whatever, what they do is they put your content in front of people and they see how many people watch it for 10, 15 seconds. And if enough people watch it, they show it to the next group. Maybe they show it to, instead of 30 people, they show it to 200. And if enough people watch it there, they show it to, you know, a thousand. And then are they sharing it? Are they liking it? Are they commenting? Are they interacting? Right. So that's basically how all of these platforms work. Um, so you'll, if you see all of a sudden, hey, you've 10,000 views on something that you did, right? Well, whatever you did worked. That's something you could put paid money behind. Right. And yeah. if whatever you did isn't work and you have 30 views, you know, it was a swing and a miss on this one. So yeah. maybe you got to change your background, right, where you're doing it. I, I noticed that I did some in my backyard. I did some reels in my backyard. 
Um, and then I did some uh, things, you know, sitting on the top of a building in Miami and the ones on top of the building in Miami perform much better. Right. Same story, same, you know, everything. Um, it just worked better. Man, and sometimes even the aesthetics of the video are important. Yeah. Yeah, really. Everything is. And then switching it, you know, again, it, it can't just be you sitting on a screen talking for two minutes. No one's going to watch that. You know, and, and that's a great point because I think um, how how would you encourage listeners to really begin to think about how they create content and advertisement and put it out there? Uh, and then how do they also use Bigly to kind of help continue to push it forward? Yeah, so we're if you're in one of the verticals that we're dealing with right now, if you're doing legal, if you're doing insurance, if you're doing uh, home services, we're happy to help. We're not taking clients outside of that area right now because we have to do so much to get each of those verticals right. Um, for us taking people all over the map, it's just too difficult for us to integrate someone quickly. Um, and you know, frankly, we're we're backed up. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have more work than we can handle at the moment. So we're, we're kind of putting the brakes on how many new clients that we're taking and uh, we're making sure that they're in a vertical that we're already dealing with, you know, to, to reduce that learning curve for, for getting everything right with, for them. Um, uh, uh, to your other question there, um, what I would do if I was looking to do some advertising and I don't have a giant budget, I wouldn't go out and hire a marketing agency. Um, I would go, I would get a video editor on Fiverr or Upwork. I would look for someone with five stars. I would give them a little bit of content of you talking or someone talking. Testimonials are great, right? Any testimonial of an actual real person talking is fabulous. You know, you have a happy customer and they're willing to say something nice about your business. Um, you know, go grab that testimonial and then hire a video editor and pay him the 50 bucks or whatever to do the video, 25 bucks. We're not talking huge amounts of money here. We're not, it's not like, oh, I got to hire this advertising agency that's going to charge me $2,500 a month. And then, you know, have that same sort of person set up your Facebook account for you if you haven't set it up right. Right. Again, everything I'm talking about here, you can probably do for a hundred bucks. And I would run some ads and I would run them broad. Now, um, the more you try to target down or niche down on this, for what I've seen, the worse your performance, which is really counterintuitive. Now, if you know the only people who buy your stuff are over 65, yeah, set it to over 65, right? You know, um, if you know that 90% of the people who buy your stuff are women, set it to women, right? You, you feel free to do something along those lines. But with Facebook and with TikTok and all these things, their algorithm is so good. What they're doing is they're looking at people who have engaged in content that is like yours, right? So if someone has just looked about a, a solution for weight loss pills, right? They're going to show them other weight loss commercials. If someone has looked at other things for children, right? Toys for children, they're going to show them other children's toys. If they've looked at other supplements for the gym, they're going to show them other supplements. If they've looked for other consulting plans, they're going to show you them consulting plans. And if you go back tonight and you actually, you know, sit down and fool around on, you know, Facebook or one of these things, you know, look at whatever ad that you're looking at, and you'll notice you're going to see five other ads that are just like that, in the next hour, right? So yeah. you just let their algorithm do the work for you and just make sure it's in the right zip codes, yeah, right? If, you know, if I'm doing it in Broward County where I live, right? I, I'm just, I have Broward County in and that's it, right? <laughs> and then I let their algorithm do the work for you. Uh, if you try to niche it down a lot, what they do is they raise your CPM. So instead of paying... 20 bucks per thousand views. Now you're paying a hundred bucks per thousand views and you almost can't overcome that. Um, you're, you know, even if your targeting is better, just because they're charging you five times as much for the same thousand views, it's really hard to overcome it. And frankly, their algorithms excellent. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree folks. I, again, going back to when I first started this podcast, I thought I was smarter than Mark Zuckerberg and his algorithm. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do my own. I'm going to narrow down my target. It's going to be this age within this county and this many people. And then it came up with like, well, you you identified six people. 
because <laughs> I niched it down so far. And it's true, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the algorithms were kind of in places. You can say whatever you want about, you know, the, the social sites. But at the end of the day, those algorithms do really do help support small businesses build their brand. In fact, uh, one business in particular that I really love to highlight is baseballism here in Oregon. Um, what their team did was they started with Instagram and just did steals, right? Posting out steals, memes of baseball slogans, right? And then they started taking off. And what they did was, okay, this meme did really well. Let's put it on a t-shirt and see if it sells. So now they're taking organic, you know, organic views and organic likes from their Instagram, putting them on a t-shirt and now create a business. That business has now sparked into a multi-million dollar business. It's a national business. You can find them, you know, they're out at the Yankee Stadium, I believe. They're at Texas Stadium, you know, the Wrigley Field, at the Field of Dreams. So you can find baseballism stores now all over this country. And I believe they're starting to go uh, nationally too. And it's just, they started out on Instagram by simply posting reels and identifying what does a consumer, again, going back to that value, right? What did the consumer consider valuable? And in, in this in this case, it's it's their the likes, right? That's how they can identify what they considered valuable. Okay, now let's see if that they consider that valuable enough to purchase it. Okay. And that's that funnel, right? That that sales funnel we're talking about. Everybody's aware of your product. Okay, now you're trying to get to a loyal consumer down to a purchase, right? You're trying to convert them to an actual purchase. Well, they were just creating awareness and trying to see if they can convert people to loyal. Now they have a loyal fan base of baseball people, you know? It's amazing. Yeah. And it's, and it's, again, it all happens organically, right? Building, building a brand is uh, sometimes built very organic, but it's, it's takes a lot of work. It's not, doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. And it's the same thing with everything. So when we're doing landing pages, we'll test different headlines and you'll, I mean, I can tell you with our main bigly page, we changed a headline one time and our conversions dropped 90% over two days. And I was like, Oh, we're going to change that one right back. Right. But literally just changing the word and, you know, it was off a cliff and then you tweak and sometimes it goes up and, and you can play around with it. You change one element on your landing page. You change one element on your site. You change the slogan. You change what's underneath. And you'll see huge differences with tiny changes. Um, for anyone doing Facebook, I would give one recommendation besides test four or five things at once. And you can always do retargeting. You can say who's seen 75% of my ad or who's clicked on my ads in the past and make sure you keep showing the, the stuff to them. Those are you know some more advanced tricks that... Again, someone can set up for you. If you need help, there's someone on Fiverr who can do that for you who's not going to charge an arm and a leg. Um, but a big thing I would throw in there, do a free-form question, right? Make them answer one free-form question if you're doing paid dollars behind it because that beats the bots right now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, otherwise you'll get a lot of fake things from all of these sites. You'll get fake calls. You'll get fake uh, forms. You'll get... You know, and we we're doing some roofing stuff, and it was pretty obvious some of the things we we're getting in were fake, right? So uh, we we're running some roofing ads, and we're like, okay, this guy's in a different state, and he lives in an apartment building, <laughs> and uh, he says he doesn't own the home, right? So you have a rental in an apartment building, you're looking to get roofed on your work done on your roof. Huh? Um, like there were some things that just jumped out at us, and as soon as you add in a free form thing. You know, if you make it mandatory and um, typically the bot doesn't know how to handle that, they'll have it automatically press a button, but they don't know how to handle the free form. So it'll eliminate most of the spam that you're getting if you put that on there. That is a great, great tip. Now, with like myself, there are multiple different social media channels, right? You have LinkedIn, you have TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, yeah. and they all do something different. Um, what would you say from, are, is there a channel that individuals should be focusing on more than others, or do they all provide a, a, the same kind of benefit? No, they're all different. So something like LinkedIn, I think works, like we used LinkedIn all the time for staffing, right? You, we would find so many people on LinkedIn. It was crazy because we could go and um, search for exactly what we were looking for. Right. So if I'm looking for a white albatross, I can put in white albatross, you know, and search it all the way down. And here's the the 50 white albatrosses, right, in my state or in the world or whatever. And now I can send them all a message. And that's pretty effective. Uh, on LinkedIn, anyone who's not on the more likely to reply, it means they haven't been there in the last 30 days. 
most people aren't on LinkedIn unless, you know, people are going to hate me for saying this, but unless they're looking for a job, they're not on there. So you're not going to find a lot of business executives hanging out on there. And if they're not in the more likely to reply, it means they haven't touched anything there in the last 30 days. So if you send them a direct message on there, you're probably not going to hear anything back. And LinkedIn charges like three bucks per direct message. Their advertising is prohibitively expensive and you're going to be advertising in front of a bunch of salespeople. Um, TikTok, younger folks. You're looking for people in their 20s. You're looking for people in their teens. You advertise on TikTok right? Uh, Facebook, you get a full gamut on there. Like there's a lot of grandmothers on there looking at baby pics. Um, like we're doing some things for solar panels. You know, most of the people who are looking at solar panels on there are over the age of 65. Interesting. Yeah. I, I thought it was interesting too. That's, I mean, so for stuff like roofs and solar panels, you know, we're talking, most of them are 55 plus and you're like, are there really a lot of 65 year olds on Facebook? But guess where my mom looks at my baby pics? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right? You know, so they're on there. I mean, if if they have grandchildren, you better believe they're on Facebook. Um, you know, and there's something like 3 billion people on there right now. Maybe I'm exaggerating slightly. Maybe it's only 2.5 monthly active users. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's it's so large. Um you know, so older people, you'll find them on Facebook. You won't find them on TikTok, Instagram. So you can advertise at the same time that you do Facebook. So those are really the same product for me. But you definitely need reels if you're on Instagram. Um, you know, so especially if it's kind of like a quick purchase, you know, that stuff works really well. You're typically not getting high intent. You're getting stuff that someone sees and they're like, ooh, I need this. Right. Or, ooh, this could be nice. And then Facebook's algorithms are so good. If they're looking at it, they keep showing them other similar content because they know they're in the market for something like that because they keep engaging with it. Right. Um, Google is really good for high intent, but it's expensive. So you want to look at doing long tail keywords, things that are less obvious. Uh, there's a tool we use called Hrefs, which I would highly recommend. A H R E F S. Uh, I love Hrefs. Um, they'll give you every kind of relevant keyword that you know you can possibly think of that people might be searching for. They'll show you your competitor sites. They'll show you your competitors' top pages. It's a little expensive. I think it's a couple hundred bucks a month, um, but. You know, if you're doing stuff online, a lot of stuff online, it's really cool and really worth it. Um, and I'm sure there's some other free competitors along those lines. Uh, Neil Patel has a lot of the the stuff with the SEO. Um, you know, so all of these things, it's it's different different things for different types. And uh, something we're exploring right now and getting set up is a lot of native ads as well where I think these days they can do a lot of the stuff that you can do with Facebook on native, right? Yeah. So the tabulas and the outbrains and the, you know, the media goes and, and all those guys. Yeah. You know, to Thomas's point, folks that are listening, I'm probably going to start to slowly transition. Now we have the shades of entrepreneurship on LinkedIn, but it's not really like that Thomas pointed out, you know, I think it made a lot of relevant sense to me is, is that platform is really focusing on like, you know, hiring and, and retaining employees. I'm not looking to grow my business from a retaining employees perspective. I'm looking to grow it from a consumer perspective, from a folks wanting to listen. Now, don't get me wrong. I think LinkedIn still has a valuable piece and I still use it very heavily from a business perspective. But I think from the shades of entrepreneurship perspective on the business page, you'll either probably see it disappear or, or slowly just kind of stop posting. You'll probably still always be on there. So if you want to, if you want to tag it by all means, but I think, you know, as Thomas is kind of pointing out, my focus might be more on, you know, creating the reels and creating content that's going to be valuable to the listeners. That's also educational, right? Because I believe that is in fact, the value that this podcast is able to provide is that education piece that ties back to the entrepreneurship, right? And the one I skipped is X. I haven't tested much on X yet, but um, I'm planning on, especially for B2B type things, right? Because there are a lot of business executives on there. There is, you know, I would say in general, kind of a higher level of discourse that you're going to find on X than you do on Facebook or Instagram. 
in general, I know that they're all kind of out there. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other thing I, I want to stay away from is typically any of the like, oh, get our expanded like audience network. I typically shy away from all that stuff because I've just found so much fraud on there. I mean, just yeah. so much fraud that, you know, we turn that off um, just to avoid because they recommend it. So the first thing you do is like, oh, they're recommending the setting. We should turn it on. Right. And then you do it. And you get a ton of in engagement and then you try calling them and the phone numbers are fake or they're a real phone number, but you pick up the phone and you call them and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't fill that thing out. Um, that particularly from that audience network type stuff, I see a lot of fraudulent material. Um, and you know, we did set up security on all the stuff. If we're sending someone to a landing page, um, you know, we have security on there where you can basically see, you know, there's nothing's private anymore, by the way. The privacy <laughs> is, um, you know, you're like, oh, we're, we're, we're going to this, uh, to this website. Like no one knows, you know, they know what your IP is. They know, I mean, they, you know, they might know your dog's name. Uh, it's, they're going to know everything. They probably know your dog's name because it's your password. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by that one exclamation point, folks. I know it. Don't lie. It's probably a capital letter and one exclamation point at the end. I know it. You know? <laughs> now, now, this has been some phenomenal advice, Thomas. Now, for the folks that are listening that want to learn more about you, maybe they're interested in connecting with you. How do they connect with you on LinkedIn or other social sites? Yeah, I mean, just come to biglysales.com, right? That's probably the best place to find us. And I haven't even really gotten into the AI much at all, which if you want to talk about that, yes, I'm happy yeah, to do as yeah, well. Yeah, I know. We've, we've been talking about sales and so much, we haven't even talked about the AI. Yeah, it's uh, well, I've been having a lot of fun with marketing, you know, over the last couple of years here and, uh, you know, all the ways it can go wrong. Um, if you're doing a lot of stuff on Google, make sure you get some security tools. Like if you're spending a significant amount of your budget on Google, get some security tools, uh, make sure you're blocking VPN traffic, make sure you're blocking data center traffic. Uh, we were getting murdered by data center traffic for a while. Some, one of our competitors put a, a bot farm on us. So we kept having new IPs come in, but they were all coming from like, you know, Moses Lake. Do right, you know where Moses Lake is there? Kind of up in your neck of the woods. Yep. Oh yeah. Right. There's not many of, people out there. Not many people. <laughs> there was more people coming to us from Moses Lake than lived in Moses Lake. Right. So we were trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And we were like, oh, there's a big Amazon data center there. It's an AWS hub. Right. And then it all made sense. Um, so make sure you block that stuff. There's a lot of tools out there that you can use to, to do this. Uh, some are more expensive than others. But you can go and, you know, block that traffic. And if if you're paying 20 bucks a click, 30 bucks a click for something, 50 bucks a click, you want to make sure it's not your competitor down the street clicking on your thing 100 times a day. You want to make sure it's not a bot farm in Pakistan, you know, um, sending traffic your way just to blow up your account because yeah. they can overwhelm you pretty quickly and then you get no results out of it. So. Uh, you got to be careful with all these guys. Um, with Google, that's we, we definitely had that happen to us. So uh, it's not that I'm saying don't use Google. I'm saying that you want to be careful because the the assumption that they protect against this sort of fraud on their network they they don't they don't care, and they will you know you'll reach out to them. You'll be like, hey, you guys got to do something about this, and they'll be like, no, we don't. Yeah. You, you you know, you meant, one of the things you mentioned was AI. In, in fact, you know, Bigly sells, you know, essentially is, is it helps find the perfect client, right? Using AI. How, yeah. how does it go through that? How do, how do you do that? So, I mean, the AI, the, the big things we're doing with the AI is to automate that outreach, right? To automate all the issues that I saw over the years with outreach that you would, people would forget to follow up when they're supposed to. Right. They, they wouldn't follow up. They would follow up once or twice and then be like, eh, you know, whatever. Um, and oftentimes the guy was just busy. Right. So he was busy. He was in another meeting. He was on another phone call. He didn't respond to it. They forgot. It wasn't a high priority. He got 47 other things going on. So someone filled out your form. We're going to assume that they're relatively interested. Right. They went to your website. They filled out a form. They said, hey, I'm interested. We're going to assume they aren't lying to you, um, but they're probably busy. Uh, number one, you have to respond right away, 
right? So any of those, that lag time is death, right? If you wait a week to get back to that person, they're not even going to remember that they filled out your form, what it was, what it's about, right? They're going to have no idea who the hell you are, you know, and you're going to call them and they're going to be like, oh, what, who? Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm interested. Click, right? <laughs> You know, and you're probably not great on the phone, you know, in general, unless you've done, you know, hundreds of thousands of cold calls, right? You know, right. you're probably not super smooth on the phone. Some of you might be, but, you know, if that's not your forte, some people kind of stumble over their words or they're a little uncomfortable picking up the phone and calling someone they don't know, right? So I, I would lead with, hey, you filled out my form, right? And I'm giving you a call to tell you about the thing that you said you were interested in, you know, something along those lines, right? to immediately let them know it's not a cold call. It's not, you know, it's not something out of the blue that you're responding to that. So because a lot of people, they don't like it, they don't do it right away. They have a lag. They say, oh, I'm going to have my admin do it or someone else, uh, or I'm going to have someone get to it on Monday, right? That just murders their sales. It just kills their sales conversion rate. So um, the big thing is automation right away and then auto respond to every message and then push them towards a goal. Again, push them to call back when the call center is open. Push them to schedule an appointment for an in-home consultation. Push them to schedule an appointment, you know, to really be able to um, push them to take an action. We're going to be able to add to push them to a website, to, like a page to buy something. Um, you know, we're just going to keep adding features on here. And the other thing is a lot of the, the form fill type stuff. Um, to be able to have that done right via a landing page, um, you know, via text uh, that we can have the the SMS go back and forth with them and ask qualifying questions, verify information, right? So we can get a lot of the information that we need over SMS. And, and finally, what we're adding here, which should be out March timeframe is uh, the voice to be able to have it actually field a voice call um, which I'm super excited about. So, you know, th those are the things I'm working on and th there's enough complex problems in there that uh, I'm plenty busy. Yeah, no. And, and, and again, folks, the bigly AI does a lot, you know, uh, AI auto respondents, uh, scheduling, um, powered emails, texting, phone calls. And additionally to that, AI landing pages. So there, so this is not just like one little thing. It has multiple layers that are kind of stacked on to this product. In fact, uh, Thomas, tell me a little bit more about the AI landing page. I would love to kind of hear about that specifically. Oh, I lost your, I lost your voice. Oh, sorry about that. I, I hit the mute button accidentally. Right now we're building out um, a number of different templates. So we have kind of a base template where what will happen is you'll put in what your company name is, your logo, uh, a little bit about your business, um, the services you provide, right? Just, you know, with a couple words and it'll build a full landing page for you. So maybe you're throwing a party, right? Maybe you're um, you know, you have an event, uh, you're doing whatever that you're trying to do and you don't want to take a couple of weeks and pay a developer to build out a landing page. It will literally just create one on the fly for you in a minute. And then you can go, you can edit it you can, you know, play around with it, change the wording. It'll have the AI write all the text for you. And then you can go in, you can pick any image from your website, any image from the internet, right? You can use our image generator, which is tied to, I believe, Unsplash and a couple of others right now, which will, you know, create images for you. And you can put those up and, and you know, do it with a couple of clicks. And, you know, our basic page generator is easy enough for anyone can do it. Um, what we're doing is we're adding right now a bunch of different templates that are relevant for different things. So if you're trying to sell an individual product, there's going to be a template for that, right? If you want to schedule appointments, there's a template for that. If you want a multi-step form where the final step is to make a call, there's going to be a template for that, right? So we're, we're taking these different business scenarios that we're dealing with right now and we're saying everything should be templated. So you can create this in seconds instead of days. 
and that is so I'm in the healthcare world and that's where I'm trying to get us to is the standardization some templates right so like data we deal with a lot of data except you can pull data in many different ways and the thing about data is data will always give you what you want but it'll never get you what you need especially in the healthcare <laughs> world right and so we're trying to figure out oh, how to HIPAA. standardize Oh man, hippie. Yeah. Believe me, trust me, all, all that fun stuff. But yeah, you know, again, uh, leveraging AI folks, I think it's not, it's don't be afraid of it. I think it's a really good way to help improve your business. Uh, again, it can think a lot smarter and faster than we can. And so just leverage it. Uh, it's not here to take over your job. It's here to make your job easier. Yeah. And I'd really like to define AI right now. What, what AI is today is an autoresponder. Uh, it's, it's autocomplete, right? So have y'all ever typed something into Google and you start typing and you put in the first word and then you say Bahamas and it says flights to hotels, things to do, restaurants, right? Well, Google knows these are the five or six most common searches that come up with it, right? And if you put in, you know, again, you start typing something and it tells you, well, this is what we've seen and this is what we think you're probably going to be looking for. That's basically how AI works. They've fed it all the content on the internet. So it's not thinking, it's not Lex Luthor thinking in the background, like, aha, this is, you know, <laughs> this is my schemes for taking over the world, right? It is auto-completing. This is what I've seen before. So when someone asks about this, this is what they've been looking for in the past. And it basically tries to guess the next word correctly. It tries to guess the next phrase correctly. And um, that's how it works. And that's how the image generators work. And that's how, you know, the text generators work. And it's pretty darn good. It wasn't really useful until about a year ago. And then when GPT-3 came out, it, all of a sudden it became wildly useful. And it's improving by leaps and bounds. Um, so you can use it to generate images. Uh, if you've played around with Midjourney, something like that. I mean, the images are wild that it comes up with in a few seconds that you put in a prompt. And I'm not a graphic designer. I could screw up a stick figure, but we, <laughs> I made some marketing flyers for my team. I'm like, guys, this is what I was thinking of, you know, um, right? The, you know, and I put in a prompt and I played around with it for five minutes. And I, I said, you know, here you go. Use these. Right. And I mean, they looked, you know, really good. You know, and if you don't like it, you say change this or change that or whatever, and it does it. So you don't need really a graphic designer anymore. Um, you can pretty much make, I mean, my nine year old can use, you know, Canva and can take an image that she creates on ChatGPT and superimpose some words on it. And she can do the graphic design. I mean, she could do my graphic design work if I wanted her to. And she's nine. And, you know, it's just not that difficult um you know, so things that you never would have been able to do before now you can do um for writing we're doing a coding contest right we're sponsoring a coding contest actually at uh, laracon in india and um i needed the rules so i i said oh, i don't know what rules i'm going to need for a coding contest so i found a couple of rules from coding contests that you know some other people had put on google and some places like that and I went to ChatGPT and I said, make, you know, convert this from to uh, a coding contest rules for this. And here's what it is. And here's what I want done. And I wrote a paragraph and I copied and pasted in the thing and bang, you know, about 30 seconds later, I had everything for my coding contest. And then I had to tweak a couple of different things, but, you know, it took what would have taken me hours and I was able to do it in five minutes. Yeah, I agree. And then and, and folks that don't use it, like to Thomas's point, there, there's going to be some edits that need to be done. So make sure you go back and read it. If you're going to use, uh, you know, chat GPT, uh, make sure you go back and read the content that it's providing you. Make sure you just, you know, double cr cross-reference it. But again, it's there to really help you speed up your work. I, I use it for my newsletters a lot. Yeah. And, and if you get work done from anyone, if you don't read it, I mean, I wouldn't expect very a very true. good product going out the door if you don't proofread things. Very true. So, you know, we, we're using it for SEO. I have a professional kind of editor um, that's on the team, but they're putting out, my SEO team's putting out 20 articles a day right now. 
because uh-huh. they use ChatGPT to do the base work and then they edit it and they put in pictures and do what they need to do and make it look nice. And, you know, we would have been lucky to get 20 articles a month out the door a year ago. Right? Uh, yeah, and, it's hard. And now we can do 20 a day. And if we weren't doing the editing piece, maybe we could do 200 a day. But, you know, with the editor, with the, taking the time to make sure the content is good and, and it looks good and, you know, the graphics are good and all the other stuff, you know, we're, we're at about 20 a day. Um, but just you can be so much more prolific than you ever could have been in the past using these tools. They're, they're definitely not something to be afraid of. They're things that will save you massive amounts of time. Um, one of the other things where I've seen a lot of businesses doing is, you know, especially slightly bigger businesses. Um, you know, one of the guys in my AI group, uh, he was doing software for trucking companies where they used to get in uh, an email saying, hey, this is what I need. And they would have to input that into their computer system. And every time they'd input it, it would take them 20 or 30 minutes. And they would get a 1,000 of these orders a day. Well, they have the AI do it. Now their error rate is lower, right? And it's saving them, you know, 20,000 minutes a day, 30,000 minutes a day for, you know, one mid-sized trucking company. And for everything where you're doing a lot of manual labor, there's an AI scraper, there's an AI, you know, you can have, you can basically have ChatGPT look at this and say, take this data when it comes in and put it into the computer. And even if it's structured poorly, you you can do that. You know, you can have a, a programmer do that in a couple of days generally. You know, you you find an engineer and, and have them do that in a couple of days for you. And it's not that complex um, in most cases. So Man, I love it. You know, again, folks listening, uh, I really hope you're taking note of a lot of the stuff that Thomas is saying, because again, a lot of this stuff is here to help you. It's, it's easy to use. Uh, and again, there's, like you mentioned, you don't know who your target audience is. He was mentioned with the solar panels. So he's 65 year old individual, 70 year old that are focusing on the solar panels. And so leveraging AI and leveraging the marketing tactics that some of these social media channels have uh, is going to be very beneficial for you to help grow your business. And Thomas, thank you again so much uh, for joining the show. Uh, before we leave, is there anything else you'd like to say before we let the listeners go? No, I mean, just, I think the most valuable thing you can do is learn AI. Uh, this is what I'm telling to, like, we get kids coming out of college. What should I look right now? What should I do? What should I focus on? Learn AI, right? Take the time, play around with it, join some groups of, of people who are using this stuff, see what they're doing. But, you know, it's just, you will be the most valuable member on any team that you join, Right. If you're if you're a fan of doing things yourself, it gives you you can do work 10 times as fast. Right. Um, if you don't know how to do something, go ask chat GPT. Right? You're talking about something on the computer. I need to set up this piece of networking equipment and I don't know how to do it. I need to set up a, a, a landing page to use bigly, but I need to get my printer set up. I don't know how to do it. Right. Rather than try to fight through this and figure it out for yourself, just go ask chat GPT. It will know how to do it. And if you hit a roadblock, you're like, hey, I hit this roadblock and I don't know what to do. And it'll be like, oh, that must mean this. So now do this, 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 and this. Because it has seen every one of these scenarios, right? Uh, The entire, you know, the entire, the entirety of human knowledge on the internet is in this program, right? Every technical document that has ever been written is in this program. So just ask it the question and it'll give you the answer. If you need to do something with programming, ask it the question, it'll give you the answer. You know, there's guys that I know who I was able to, I'm not an engineer by trade. I was able to stand up uh, um, something in Python in about two hours. I had to download like 15 different Python libraries. I had to set up a compiler. I had to like, (laughs) it's like a 40 step process and and I was able to get it done. It's like, it's literally like looking at those Lego instructions. Yeah. Have you you ever played with the Legos? (laughs) Right. At least the ones that aren't too advanced. You know, once I stuck into the ones for like 15 year olds, I, I can have problems, but like the, you know, the beginning ones that they give the kids. And all of a sudden you have this beautiful like Lego structure in front of you that you would never have been able to put together without those instructions. 
So they, they can show you how to do everything and just save you so much time. You want to set up a web app, right? You'll be able to set up a web app in a day, right? You'll be able to program it, get it live, get it on the internet. Um, you know, you want something a little more complex than just a landing page. You know, you can go to Bubble and ask ChatGPT how to do it and, you know, boom, you'll have that thing live. So, you know, it, it, I really think it makes all problems kind of solvable um, for most people. And if you use it, you know, you'll know how to do everything, right? You'll be able to figure out everything. It's just if you want to spend your time on it. Thomas Bryan, the CEO of Bigly AI. Thank you again so much for joining the show. For those that are interested in connecting with uh, Thomas, I'll have this information on the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter, which you can subscribe to by visiting theshadesofe.com. Please follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram uh, by following at the Shades of E. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>